this particular portion of the program is probably more aligned with the Summer of Love as um, we're going to be looking at how the counterculture has affected the gender revolution over the last 50 years. And I have to tell you, when I was doing my own research, I read a book called The Daughters of Aquarius, which really opened my eyes to what the counterculture did for us with regard to our gender stereotypes. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, because I've always been a hippie wannabe anyway. And uh, this just kind of reaffirmed that for me. And in reading that book, I, I, felt, I felt that, yeah, we really owe so much to people who um, they're determined to uh, uh, put their values into action. And, and now it's mainstream counterculture values. So um, Gretchen uh, Lemke Santangelo is a professor at St. Mary's College, and um, it is her book, Daughters of Aquarius, that I read. And she's always been very generous with me, uh, answering all my questions while I was writing my thesis, et cetera. And now she's here this evening to moderate this portion of the event. So please help me welcome Gretchen Lemke Santangelo. Thank you. Um, and I was asked to provide a little bit of historical context before we start our panel conversation. And I don't like to read things, but I'm going to read this just to make it go more quickly so we can have more time for the actual panel discussion. Um, so prior to the radical feminist revolution of the 1960s, thousands of young people rejected their parents' version of the American dream and sought, really without any role models or clearly mapped alternatives, to live in a way that was cooperative, non-materialistic, emotionally and physically expressive, and respectful of nature. Above all, they prioritized the individual quest for creative fulfillment, spiritual transcendence, and intimate community. Young women, though, had additional gender-related reasons for joining this utopian project. Escape from the nuclear family-based domesticity that had circumscribed the lives of their mothers and the so-called shit jobs that offered less pay, autonomy, and creative fulfillment than those available to men. Now, the alternative culture that they created did indeed provide women with unprecedented physical, creative, and spiritual freedom, the kind of unfettered, no-holds-barred freedom traditionally reserved for men. Within its spaces, women pushed back against the sexual double standard and developed more positive relationships with their bodies and their sexuality. In search of enlightenment, they pursued a dizzying array of spiritual alternatives, experimented with consciousness-altering substances, and traveled, often unaccompanied, across country and to far-flung regions of the globe. In their search for right livelihoods, they channeled their creativity into new directions, experimental theater, psychedelic music, crafts production, graphic arts, um, clothing design, and into building alternative institutions, including free schools, food and clothing distribution programs and clinics, food co-ops, runaway shelters, arts and crafts cooperatives, recycling programs, and alternative childbirth centers. And they embraced communal living. Now, within communal households, the gender division of labor was strikingly conventional, <laughs> with women providing a disproportionate share of the domestic labor needed to sustain their alternative families, or what they often called tribes. However, I must say that women's actual tasks, the non-privatized setting in which they were performed, and the sense of larger purpose that informed their work made it all appear rather novel, challenging, and exhilarating. 
Many, particularly those on rural communes in very rustic environments, mastered a whole new repertoire of skills, such as organic farming, composting, animal husbandry, canning, brewing, cheese making, quilting, midwifery, and holistic healing. And the rigors of communal life, especially rural community life, often demanded a high degree of flexibility when it came to gender roles. So as one woman noted, I can mix cement, blow dynamite, bank a fire, use a chainsaw, split wood, ride bareback, hunt mushrooms, start fires, frame roofs, cure bacon, and punch cows. Now, the counterculture wasn't, however, a gender paradise. Communal living did offer richer interpersonal rewards, but coupled with liberal attitudes towards sexuality, it also generated tension and conflict within relationships to the extent that even the most committed of couples had difficulty holding it together. And some men added fuel to this emotional stew by using the rhetoric of sexual liberation to avoid commitment, push for open relationships, and pressure women into having sex. And when women refused to comply, they risked being labeled as hung up or repressed. And at the same time, the counterculture accommodated an unrestrained masculinity imitative of the more macho beats, bikers, racialized bad cats, and Western outlaws. And the bravado, hyper-individualism, irresponsibility, and aggression that this construct sanctioned undermined communal stability and trivialized women's contributions. And women, particularly in male-dominated arenas of, and I'm looking over at Denise, male-dominated arenas of music, broadcasting, recording, underground comics, the underground press, were subject to high levels of misogyny. And predictably, this led to a feminist uprising. By the early 1970s, women were kicking out the cowboys and claiming complete ownership of communal experiments. At the very least, they were demanding greater respect within their own families and communities. Still others used their newfound power to claim leadership positions in new age, peace, anti-nuke, and environmental movements. Um, basically extending the countercultural agenda well beyond the 1960s. And in the process, they left us with a usable past. Renewable energy alternatives, voluntary simplicity, green building practices, organic gardening, composting, community-supported agriculture, farmers markets, bioregionalism, ecofeminism, and preventative and holistic medicine, as well as earth-reverent spirituality, all have their roots in the counterculture and all hold out hope for a more sustainable future. And hopefully we'll get into all of this in more detail in our panel discussion. Um, so Denise Kaufman, a veteran of the free speech movement, former member of the Merry Pranksters, and co-organizer of the Trips Festival, went on to make music with the Ace of Cups, an all-girls psychedelic rock band that expressed her generation's utopian vision. She, like so many others, helped move counterculture value, values and practices into the mainstream. Um, she established a free school. She served in local government as her first, her community's first um, woman county council person, um, teaching yoga, and continuing to pr perform as a musician. Alexandra Hart, Renowned fiber artist and chronicler of countercultural folk art was an early pioneer of Bay Area experimental theater or happenings. A co-organizer of the Trips Festival and a co-founder of the Morning Star Ranch Commune, which I believe was one of California's first open door communes. She too has remained faithful to countercultural values through her ongoing engagement with the arts and most recently in our work with our community's elders. 
Roland Jacopetti, Alexandra's former partner in marriage and in producing happenings, organizing the Trips Festival and founding the Morning Star Ranch, was also a much beloved radio personality at KMPX and KSAN. And I'm gonna quote him here. Having worked through, quote, oppressively masculine behavior patterns, unquote, he has plenty of good advice for, quote, men, young and old, unquote, who wanna be part of the gender revolution. So, say that. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so the first question has to do with growing up in the post-war period and whether you felt constrained and confined by conventional gender roles and expectations. Um, so do you want to start, Denise? Sure. Um, so I grew up in San Francisco, and I definitely felt constrained and confined by the gender expectations. I think uh, girls like me were kind of labeled tomboys mm -hmm. because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Luckily, my parents were pretty great. They supported me, but the larger culture didn't. So the classes I wanted to take in junior high school were wood shop and metal shop, but we, girls weren't allowed to take that. I wanted to play sports with, uh, you know, there were, there were like girl sports and boy sports, and girl sports had all these very um, restrictive rules. Like girls basketball, you had to dribble three times and then shoot. You couldn't pass it, you couldn't run down the court. I mean, there were all these stupid rules, and so I, um, rebelled against all of those and played basketball after school with the boys and rode horses and took the bus down to, um, to Golden Gate Park with my bow and arrow and shot archery down at, like, in, the, in the avenues. There was an archery place there where you could shoot and I took my fishing pole down to Aquatic Park and fished and I just kind of did what, what I wanted to do in the context of the city and uh, and those were just early days, you know? I just felt like these rules are stupid and I'm not going to listen. And, um, but, you know, when you were talking about the communes, I think when some of the roles um, hap kind of continued, the old roles continued in the communes, it's because girls weren't allowed to take metal shop and wood shop. We could have been a lot more help in the communes if we had more carpenter <laughs> skills, but we, didn't, we weren't allowed to get them. So unless you had a, a dad or a mom that could taught you, you know, so it was definitely a time of shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, unlike my uh, friends on both sides who grew up in San Francisco, I grew up in Southern Idaho. This is Mormon country, folks. I come from a Mormon family. <laughs> uh, that is to say, my grandparents were pulling us on both sides and my parents rebelled. So my parents raised me in their own pretty small, what they, they considered themselves bohemians. Uh, so they were actually counterculturists, and I, was, uh, I benefited greatly from having that uh, at home, because when I went into school, it was very different. And it was religious prejudice there. So it, I was uh, always looking for a way, a place to fit in. I didn't think I'd find uh, a man because <laughs> I, where I was, they were all Mormons and it wasn't something that I could do, you know, fit into. But fortunately, I found my way to San Francisco. I had a friend who had been traveling and, and uh, I met him in Salt Lake City at the time. And he said, you belong in North Beach. <laughs> <laughs> so at 19 years old with a baby in arms and having uh, left uh, one fellow behind, I arrived in North Beach and shortly after met Roland, who was then at that time. And um, it, uh, 
I found, we, we kind of settled into a, uh, an artist scene. So uh, he was an actor looking at little theater, friends in the meme troupe, uh, you know, where of course uh, we did eventually meet Bill Graham and you know, the Trips Festival and all of that history. Um, and uh, I was more interested in the arts and I had grandmothers who were very really fine needle women. And so uh, fiber art was kind of a natural thing for me to just evolve, develop, uh, develop I mean, on my own. Uh, and uh, I, because an artist scene is pretty loose with the uh, cultural elements, we were, I was able to find that I fit in better there than I ever had before. And so I never joined the counterculture. I felt like the counterculture joined me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that gets to the background piece. Yeah. <laughs> um, my father, uh, my father did me a favor because uh, he was such an oppressive husband that uh, there was no way I ever wanted to grow up to be like him in that respect. There were things I liked about my father. He was sort of a classic San Francisco first generation American. His parents were from Italy. Uh, my mother, however, was uh, very much like Alexandra. She was from, uh, from Utah, and uh, part of her family was Mormon, but not all of it. Uh, but I grew up not wanting to be the kind of uh, oppressive husband that my father was. So I went off to school and I, uh, I went to uh, St. Vincent de Paul School in San Francisco for eight years and St. Ignatius High School run by the Jesuits uh, for four years. I went to school with Jerry Brown. He was two years behind me. Uh, and various other San Francisco luminaries. Uh, by the time I got out of 12 years of Catholic school, I didn't want to see another Catholic church ever. <laughs> I hated it all. And, uh, but I had many friends that were uh, Italian kids from North Beach, and I spent a lot of time in North Beach. And we decided, oh, Come on, let's let's go to midnight mass on Sunday. Uh, let's go to midnight mass on Christmas Eve, and and uh, we should really do it. And we went to midnight mass and listened to a sermon about how <clears throat> people weren't giving enough money to the parish. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely it. Um, as soon as I got out of high school. Uh, I was just waiting to be able to do theater. And so I did theater of various kinds and, and uh, did the Trith Festival and things like that. And uh, almost by accident, uh, got into radio, uh, into uh, KSAN, the great San Francisco radio station. That was my first radio job, unbelievably enough. and. Uh, one of the things that I remember from radio, <clears throat> it wasn't at case then, it was at a uh, um, Sonoma County radio station. Um, we had a client who was a Japanese, it was a Japanese restaurant in Santa Rosa. Uh, he didn't speak much English, uh, but he, he seemed to like everything that I did. And so I, I tried, pushing the envelope as much as I possibly could. So uh, I, uh, I evolved uh, a spot, a radio ad, uh, in which um, a couple was going to this Japanese restaurant. But the roles were reversed. Uh, the man was uh, sort of shy and awkward and uh, said things like, uh, I don't know very much about wine. Why don't you order for me? Uh, and uh, uh, 
I had the, the woman who was playing the traditional man's part. Uh, the, the, the man said, uh, well, you better, you better order that for me too. Uh, I don't know much about things like that. And the woman said, well, I'm a great teacher. <laughs> well, this, is, this is kind of a, a, a lead in to um, the new question or the second question, some of which um, some of you have already touched on. And that is... Let me just, one more okay. line of that. Uh, the thing that I remember most about making that spot was uh, the guy that I worked with was recording it. And uh, he, he was saying to the woman, no, 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 be more of an asshole. <laughs> That's great. That's my background. Yeah. So, so I was interested in hearing um, whether the counterculture um, gave you the freedom to experiment with and carve out new gender roles and identities. You know, in other words, how did it extend the realm of possibilities for you and for other young men and women who are part of that? Do you want to go please? Sure. Um, the counterculture for me had more to do with freedom of all sorts. Everywhere there was uh, someone who, or some class of people who were being oppressed, that was where I wanted to see something change and, and movement. And so uh, it seems like the counterculture itself encased, in, in but in different uh, places, like the um, uh, the black community, as the hidden figure women earlier were talking about, uh, it was uh, uh, the eventually the gay community, and as that's been sliding into um, gender fluidity in these days, but. Uh, uh, women's rights, and we started talking about women. Started talking about. Wait a minute, you know, there's we're not <laughs> we're not being treated equally. So any place where there wasn't the uh, equanimity between uh, and among people was where uh, it felt like the attention needed to go. And, uh, so well, and in my own field of artistry. Um, Yes, I used uh, fiber arts, but I was part of that uh, movement that made, um, that expanded the definition of fine art mm -hmm. and made things like uh, things that were sewn with a needle be actually an art, which uh, is now kind of established, but for a long time it was only craft and only seen that way and not, uh, you couldn't charge the same kinds of prices that canvas could, uh, painters who painted on canvas could. And so uh, that, that's a lot of where my energy has gone. So how did the counterculture like give the space for this kind of exploration and freedom? Uh, that would be a way to kind of say what, what you're asking, Gretchen. Yeah, or did it? Um, did it give you the freedom to experiment? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it new identities. totally did. Because first of all, there was a, a sense of community. So it's always kind of some power in numbers. And so when, you know, from that place of feeling maybe alone in, in uh, mm -hmm. the way you were describing and certainly the way I was, when you, you know, just starting to meet other people who also were breaking out of those um, or not subscribing to the, the assigned roles, that it was really powerful to find other people that were also kind of playing in these new fields. Um, um, I think, I guess for me, psychedelics has had a big, you know, role in that. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. Oh, good. No, because yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking, this is, I, I just, I wanted to ask, but didn't know whether we'd have time. Did psychedelics like really break up that kind of gender binary, like that, like any really? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the psychedelic experience. Uh, dissolves 
for at least for me and I think for a lot of other people, you know, all the notions of reality that we had been given and, and thought we were supposed to subscribe to. I mean, when we actually feel that we are one vibrating, flowing energy field together and that all of these apparent differences are just kind of like colors of a rainbow, but they, they don't, you know, they don't have all the baggage. You know, that we are one entity, one energy. That when you feel that in your, own, in your own molecules, then what there is to do is to honor that and to work toward an expression of that in the world. So in your art, in you know, your music, in your poetry, in whatever you're up to, that it serves that fundamental knowing that we're all in this together and we're, if we want to work toward a world that reflects that, that's all there is to do. That's all there is to do, however we can do it, and then apply whatever gifts or talents we have toward serving that. Yeah, I'd like to add to that that, the, uh, that psychedelics made it very clear how to separate that cultural download and push that out and find out what's real and what's coming from what, uh, who you are, what, uh, what's, what's true and meaningful. And it, it just it was really easy to just kick out the, that, uh, um, the kind of paint <laughs> of the, the painting over the truth that the uh, uh, cultural download could do. Now, there's other, there are aspects of the cultural download that have been important, but it's, you know, you can separate it. Mm. Roland, did, I, did, I, I, sorry, I, did, did the counterculture provide men with the opportunity to um, kind of deconstruct masculinity? Yes, <clears throat> a lot of men didn't do that. And uh, I agree with, with what they were saying. Uh, about the importance of the drug experience. Um, remember, this is a culture that, uh, that determinedly called women chicks. And I even remember feeling a kind of a, like a, a, a mosquito stinging me when I, when I heard that. Uh, but it was very hard to maintain that uh, uh, my chick uh, attitude when you and that chick are both extremely stoned on a psychedelic drug and are <laughs> <laughs> seeing each other in an entirely different light. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, that that was part of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, things would have been so different had we not had psychedelics. Yeah. I mean, pot went a long way, but Acid that went the rest of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Roland already touched on this, but were there aspects of the counterculture that were sexist, misogynistic, and homophobic? I know you can speak to that, Denise. Well, I think because these, these were like endemic cultural attitudes, and you don't just take an acid trip or something like that. They, they come up, you know, there's that game, Bop It, you know? And you kind of hit it there, and it comes up there, you know. And you, <laughs> you know, and you get into yoga, but then the guru in yoga is trying to like get get it on with all the young women, or you know, whatever it is. You know, it's like you think you're in a new form, but then the old um, patterns emerge, and it takes a while for those patterns to really be diminished and cleansed out of the culture. And I think that's you know our job is to keep recognizing it. And it's like the panel that was before us, you know, what, what Judy and Tarita were talking about, you know, I mean, I mean, there were these patterns that, that all of us carry that we just need to ongoingly um, bring our awareness to and be trying to, you know, take a look and, and then dismantle or deconstruct, you know. Um, so yeah. Do you and kind of an allied question, and um, and then you can respond. Everyone else can respond to both. Do you remember a moment like a, a feminist awakening, um, 
or was it a series of events that led you to conclude that I think it was a series for me. I, I don't know that was real. I mean, and really, it continued on. <laughs> it continues on. Um, but yeah, it was because I, there were things that I would catch myself having accepted, and then I'd wake up and go, you know, long after I was uh, out of the Ace of Cups, I was living in Kauai. I was the first woman EMT on Kauai, and I, you know, I got told I couldn't practice on Kauai because some of the firemen's wives didn't want me to be in the same room overnight in case we got a call with them. And it wasn't like a personal thing. It wasn't like me personally. They didn't want their husbands to be on duty with a woman overnight. Mm -hmm. And so I got, I was the one who had to like go to a different island to work. So it was like afterwards, the woman after me, the, and the, uh, there was no woman on the, on the force for a while. A few years later, a woman took over, I mean, took, took that job and she sued the company and won. Mm -hmm. You know, but at the, and then I was like, what? Why did I take it? You know, why wasn't I? What? What was I thinking? You know, that I didn't just say no. I'm not going to do that. So I think for me, it's been an ongoing um, awakening. And um, but I think as as far as in music with the Ace of Cups, um, there were times where um, we ran into just a wall of uh, um, like no like no one could relate certain people couldn't just relate to us as women musicians um can i say one more quick thing oh yeah so um just so just how this plays out uh just recently i since our last panel um i did a bunch uh, long interview with bbc they were doing a two-part series on the summer of love so they sent a whole film crew from england and I did like a four hour interview with them and they were asking questions, it was all men. And they were asking these questions, you know, all of what was it like to be a woman and did you feel, you know, all of this thing. When the thing came out, when the TV show came out, on the, you know, the, when you first come on the screen, there's like an identifying label or name, right? So I was, I think the only woman on this, interviewed in this first hour. All the men that were in bands were identified as musician. I was identified as singer. Oh. <laughs> and I, I wrote to them, I said, you know, for somebody that this whole, this was your whole subject and you blew it, right? That guy is a bass player and singer in his band. I'm a bass player and singer in my band, but he's the musician and I'm the singer, right? So. Denise, tell the story also of your uh, recording uh, contract, that you didn't get one when... Well, I think we just didn't, I think we didn't get signed as a band in those days, partly because the record companies were coming, they were all from LA, maybe a couple from New York, but mostly LA, and they were, the music business at that time, they were looking for who was going to be the American Beatles or who was going to be, you know, the, the answer to what was happening in England. And um, so the Jefferson Airplane got signed. So a lot of the bands that we played with got signed. And I think one of the reasons we didn't is those guys, especially from, you know, the L.A. guys, they just looked at us. They couldn't figure us out at all. We were five hippie women. We all sang lead our genres of music were wide. We didn't just have one sound. We did all kinds of things. And I think we were just way out of the box. Mm -hmm. And luckily, now, all these years later, we got signed by and our, our owner of our label just walked in right there. Hi, George. So George, Thank you. George from High Moon Records <laughs> totally recognized the thing that, you know, about us that was unique and interesting. and. Uh, other, other than George, um, I mean, we, no one would hear our music, but uh, we've been recording. Alec Palau. <laughs> Alec Palau, absolutely. Alec Palau first resurrected us with old tapes that he found, and he brought the first uh, live project out. But then now we're doing a studio project, and that, that we are so grateful for, because I think some of the music that you'll hear, if you hear it, um, will speak to these issues in a way that other voices from that time didn't. Mm -hmm. So we're excited to share our music because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexandra, you. do you remember sexism well, and? Yeah, I remember a couple of moments. Uh, mostly, it's just, has been a slow just e evolution for me. But uh, one was at Morning Star Ranch, 
when uh, I was the macrobiotic cook, <laughs> or the only cook. <laughs> and if I wanted to have a meal with the group or with the fa my family, which we had one son with us, then he was eight, I believe. And uh, if I wanted to have a, a meal, then, and I might as well do macrobiotics because it was mostly brown rice. And <laughs> um, uh, then I cooked, and uh, no one else ever cooked. And I don't know that anyone else ever did dishes either. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Roland was reminding me on the way when we drove down today that uh, he had asked, well, uh, well, do you think we're going to want to stay here? And I was thinking, well, you know, uh, it seems like uh, all of the uh, the people who are coming, and this was really early days, and it is true that this was the first open commune in California, probably, period, uh, it, that uh, most of the people who were coming seemed like they'd never had to clean up the room, and they certainly weren't going to start now. <laughs> In fact, uh, one of the things that happened at Morningstar was, uh, this was after we left, uh, there were people who were taking down one end of the house and feeding it into the fireplace. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I that. So uh, when my answer to Roland at that point was, well, I don't think I want to be house mother forever. Yeah. <laughs> So that was one moment. Another moment was actually, uh, it didn't come home to me at the time, but it was Trips Festival. And at that point, uh, women were, in the counterculture, I think everywhere, were tending to uh, do a lot of the work that their men needed to have done for a particular project or whatever. They were doing a lot of the, you know, were helping and so on. And the men always got the credit. So uh, this, this is, is like- This is a thread. <laughs> this is like uh, 2008 maybe, when the movie, the Trips Festival came out. And there was a uh, premiere of it in Mill Valley and I heard about it from Roland because he'd been asked to be on a panel. I didn't even get offered a ticket. Right. I, I was a non-person. Even, what, 45 years later, or whatever that, however, I can't bother to add and subtract there. But uh, I had to ask Roland to get me a ticket so I could go. <laughs> and it, it, it was just pervasive that the, the guys got all the credit and the women did a whole lot of the work. Right. Here, so here. that was another of those moments. Yeah. You mentioned the chick thing bothering you. Um, were there other aspects of the counterculture that you felt were misogynistic and sexist? Well, it, it seemed to me that there were people that that thought that that uh, being in this this uh, wonderful entity called the counterculture really gave you the right to be even more unpleasant to women than you had been before. <laughs> that uh, oh well, get over it was uh, I think a, a very uh, common answer to uh, a woman who objected to some aspects of being ordered around. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was a movement that was premised on, um, f on freedom. Um, so I can imagine that if a woman did um, challenge what was going on, well, you know, you're free to leave. Kind of reaction. Ball breaker. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 When we lived in communes with our band and with our extended families, which we did, by that time, and that would be like 68, 
because kind of I had earlier experiences on the bus with Kesey, and that was a lot more free flowing. <laughs> but by the time our, our band and our extended family lived together, you know, we'd have a schedule on the refrigerator of like who was going to the farmers market and who was washing dishes, and like then we pretty much adhered to it, and that was very much divided fairly mm -hmm. amongst us all. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the last question I have. Um, I don't think I should ask because I, we only have 10 minutes left and I'd like to leave room for, for questions. The question I was gonna ask is, is the work of the gender revolution complete? What remains to be done and what <laughs> advice would you give young people who are struggling to break free of present day gender norms and expectations? Um, so if somebody from the audience wants to ask that. Um, Um, th that was a little bit later yeah. um, with Olivia Records and, you know, like there were a lot of women that really started. So I was already, I was, had moved to Hawaii and I was kind of in another little bardo by that time. Um, and, but there's a really interesting movement now. I've been sort of following it on um, online in Europe to have women's only big festivals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, big, giant, big festivals. And there's a sort of a movement to have that. And then s some of the men are like writing like, that's terrible, you know, and, you know, but it's and other men. And then most recently what happened, it was, um, it was all in Europe. And I, I think it was in one of the, either in Britain or one of the Scandinavian countries. There was a, a guy on stage, big guy, tattooed, you know, real kind of heavy, heavy, um, not a heavy metal necessarily band, but strong, big ma masculine. And there were, um, passing a woman across the, you know, across hands, you know, like the way, the way you do in festivals. And this guy, the lead singer, saw some guy grab a woman's breasts while she was being passed. He stopped the show, had the light go on that guy and called him out so strong that everybody, like he had to, he had to leave the concert. I mean, it was, you know, and he was just a total champion. And it was a powerful moment, totally went viral. So, I personally, as we're looking to what's next, I feel like there are so many men that they themselves are looking deeply at these issues. Um, the guys, so many men in my life are so amazing and really um, championing women and championing, and because it's always gotta be those who have the power that are the ones that are, you can't just take it. They have, you know, like the, if, you are, if you have the power, you have to start to share it and make sure that you bring others up and in. Mm -hmm. And I think people are doing that, you know, not our president, but others. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we have time for one, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how thought to par parent your children differently than the previous generation or any These guys created free schools. Uh, yeah. Well, you yeah. start, because Molly went <laughs> yeah. to that school. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I, I think I could wind something else I wanted to say into that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I wanted my kids to uh, be free, and uh, one of the things that uh, I probably say, tell more often than not about my child, my kids' childhood, uh, it was our, our daughter, Natalia, Tali, she never goes by her full name, Tali, uh, who was four or five, and she was really a little thing. And she said, how come we don't have a regular mom and a necktie dad? <laughs> <laughs> she really is a mainstream person. It has taken me most of my uh, growing since then, becoming a grandmother, <laughs> to realize that I was trying to make her into my idea of what free is rather than her idea of what free is. So there's, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, just as the uh, counterculture uh, was exploring different kinds of family, different ways of living together, uh, 
multiple relationships, polyamory, all of that sort of thing. That continues to be things that uh, even the young people now are exploring. It's the, there's not an, a, a new norm has not yet been found that works for everybody. everybody. It may not exist. <laughs> I think one of the things about parenting that I really um, tried to embody was really listening to my child. And when she was little, she would come home from overnights at other people's houses, um, especially when we, when we lived in Kauai, and she, she would say, you know, that person's parents, they don't listen to her. You know, they don't pay attention to her. It's like she felt respected, like her opinions were respected. And that was something she had from when, you know, right from small. Um, and I think like, just as you described, you know, given the tomboy that I was, you know, when she was about, when we were living together, Molly, you know, I remember one of Tor's birthdays, maybe her 10th birthday, and I got her a punching bag, and I got her, um, I, I just got her, what else did I get her? Like a couple of other, things that I really would have wanted. And she was like, I want a pink, a bed with a pink, you know, <laughs> canopy bed and I want a doll. And I was like, okay, you know, I, was, I want her to be tough and not take it, you know. And so, you know, it's just, just what you said, you know, we have to um, um, just keep dancing with their souls and spirits and um, not have an agenda other than to nourish that being, right? I think our time is up. Yeah. Yes, it is, but I yeah. thank you so much, and I'm feeling that spirit. It's wonderful. Um.